Hey, as you're sitting down, say hey to somebody around you. Tell them it's good to see you this morning. We are so thankful and excited that you're here today. My name is Pastor Nick Newman, and it's just a privilege and an honor to get to hang out with you this morning. We believe that you could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be right here. And so we're thankful for that. And what I want to do is if you're a first time guest, I just want to, I want to put you at ease for a second, because here's what I know. If you're coming to a church for the first time, there are times where it can be really awkward, right? So you never know what to expect. You never know what you're going to get into. But here's what we want you to know about Propel. This is a place where you can belong before you believe. This is a place where no matter who you are or what you've been through, you're welcome. And so church, can you help me welcome every person here for the first time this morning? We hope that today's worship experience is life-giving and life-changing, that you may have come in here one way, but you leave totally different. Now, we're in week three of a series called Elisha, a tale of ridiculous faith. And throughout this series, we've been looking at the life of the prophet Elisha. And in week one, we talked about this ridiculous commitment that he made to burn the plows, to basically kill off the old way of living and step into what God had called him to. And then last week, we talked about this thing where you and I at times uh, can really just pray, 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 and come to God begging for something to happen, but we never put forth the work that it takes to see the miracle. So we talked about digging ditches, how we're not going to be people who just pray, but we're going to be people who dream big, but start small. We're going to grab a shovel and we're going to dig some ditches. We're going to get to work because we're going to, I love what one uh, theologian says. He says that we're going to pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on us. The days of being lazy as a follower of Jesus are over. We're going to put some work to it. And this week, we're going to continue in a story in 2 Kings chapter 4, where we see this woman who has this really big need. Now, I don't know, has anybody in here ever been overwhelmed, right? Like, most, some of you, Ben, some of you are like, that's not past tense, right? Like, I am there currently. I am incredibly overwhelmed. I think life at times is overwhelming. You may have too many responsibilities. There's challenges everywhere. Every time you feel like you're gaining some ground, something happens, and you just feel like you can't get ahead, right? You feel like you're constantly losing. Life begins to bog us down over and over, and it's just like carrying more and more and more weight. I think many of us live our lives running on empty, there's two types of people in this world. There are those who will fill their gas tank at a quarter of a tank and those who will run it all the way down to E. For some of you, your car has indicated that you have zero miles left, but you're still pushing forward. And it's overwhelming, right? Life can be overwhelming at times. And many of us find ourselves in a position where we don't have any energy. We don't have any time. And if we're really honest, we lack faith. We're going to pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 4 of a woman who has just lost her husband, and her husband uh, ran up some debt. A debt now has to be collected, and they're coming to take her sons as payment for that debt. She's just lost her husband. Now she's in the process of losing her kids, and she's completely overwhelmed. The emotional stress of the situation is just too much to handle. Here's what we find in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, the, man of a, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Now, in this culture, in this time, olive oil was this incredibly hot commodity. But here's what we find with this woman. If you look back, many scholars believe that this was actually the wife of a prophet named Obadiah. And if, if, 
it was in fact the wife of the prophet Obadiah, there was no wonder she was broke. It's pretty common for prophets to be broke, but Obadiah had this thing going on where he wouldn't really take care of himself. He would help other prophets out. In fact, what scripture tells us about Obadiah is that he helped right around 50 other prophets. So he's helping all these people do the work of the ministry, to do what God's called them to do, to step out in faith. And meanwhile, he's just racking up, like his MasterCard is on point. He's just American Express, whatever he can get his hands on, he's racking up this debt over and over and over again. And this woman has this debt that she can't pay. And in this time, in order to pay the debt, what they would do is they would just come now that he's dead and say, hey, it's time to pay. Like, like we realize that the breadwinner of your home is gone and you can't pay. So what do you have? And the only thing that she has is, is two sons. I mean, they were prophets. They would move from town to town. They would tell people about what God was saying and what he was doing. And financially, they're not in a good place. And so they come and they say, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your sons as payments. Could you just imagine for a moment what this mother is going through? She's just lost her best friend. She's just lost the person that she's done life with. And in this culture, in this time, she couldn't go get a nine to five. There was one job she could do outside of the home, and it was to sell her body for money. And she's stuck. There's nothing she can do, but it's in this moment that she begins to cry out for help. She's got a really big problem. I don't know about you. I know some of you have big problems, but I think a lot of us, we get overwhelmed by the little problems in life. And then when the big problems of life come, they kill us because we've let the little things get in the way. Like, like for example, I, I, I'm driving down the road the other day and I'm getting so angry because my GPS keeps telling me to go a different route. And I know you're thinking, oh, pastor, you get angry. Like James says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. I'm just trying to, trying to get something this morning. So he says, so, so I'm driving down the road and, and, and I feel like uh, it looks like I'm supposed to turn at the next exit, but I drive a little bit and then all of a sudden it goes rerouting because I missed my exit. You ever been there? It's the most frustrating thing in the world. That's not really a big problem, but in the moment I got overwhelmed. For some of you, you get overwhelmed by little things all at the time, you, you, you get overwhelmed or upset at the fact that they put too much cheese on your salad at a restaurant. I'm just saying, if you don't eat a salad, they won't put too much cheese on it. Uh, for others of you, you get overwhelmed because of what's going on in life. Maybe you've driven up to Krispy Kreme and the hot and now sun wasn't on. I mean, that, I don't know if that's a big problem or not a big problem, but others of us, man, we get overwhelmed because we take the perfect Instagram selfie, right? We got a great Instagram picture and it only gets seven likes. And Patricia takes a horrible picture and she gets 40,000 likes on her. Like we get overwhelmed by the little things. But this woman has this incredibly huge problem and it's in the middle of her big problem that she realizes that she doesn't have what she really wants. Like there's no way that she can pay the debt that she has. And, and we could talk about this part about the debt for, for a long time because you and I have to understand that there's a debt on our lives because of sin. But thankfully, we have a God who makes a way where there was no way and our debt through Jesus was completely alleviated. But what happens for this woman is she realizes that she doesn't have what she wants. And if you're taking notes this morning, here's what I want you to write down. When you don't have what you really want, you'll realize that God is what you really need. That when you don't have what you really want, it will bring you to a place where you realize that God is all you need. And I think for some of us, the unfortunate thing is that we're really hard-headed and God has to teach us sometimes that he is the only thing that we have so that we'll realize he's really all we need. She gets to this place where she realizes, I, I'm out. I, I, I can't do anything on my own. There's no way I can provide for myself. There's no way that I can get myself out of this. I need God to move on my behalf. And I don't know what you find yourself overwhelmed with this morning. I don't know where you find yourself, but here's what I do know. God is all you need. No matter what situation, no matter what you're going through, you're not going to find the answers in a bottle. You're not going to find the answers in a pill. You're not going to find the answers on Google. It's only in God that you'll find what you really need. 
And so she asked this question. He, she, she comes to him. She's asking for help. And Elisha could have responded with, hey, look, at the end of the day, that's not my problem. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't need to help you. I don't have to help you. Um, but here's what he says. He says this in verse 2. Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? How can I help you? I, I, I think that some of us feel like we have to be uh, super educated or have our Christian black belt um, before we actually be, start being used by God. Do you know that all God needs is for you to be available? For when he brings somebody in your path, when he brings somebody to you that has a need for you to go, how can I help? I believe that God has given you the resources that you need to help the people that he brings in your path. But it starts with asking this question, how can I help? How can I help? You don't have to come to the pastor every time somebody needs prayer because you have the same access to the Holy Spirit. You can talk to God. I'm not saying you don't, you don't ever have to come. Like you, I'm more than happy to pray with you. I love you. But here's what I'm saying. Too many people rely on their pastor to do the work of what God has called all of us to do. The Great Commission wasn't just for ministry leaders. It was for every follower of Jesus right. to go out and make disciples, to tell people about God. He says, how can I help you? God doesn't need you educated. He needs you available because it's the Holy Spirit that equips us and calls us and guides us. And so he continues on in that passage. He says, then tell me, what do you have in your house? He doesn't say, what do the people have around you? He says, what do you have? Because the answer to your problems is actually in what God has already given you. And so then he says, your servant, she responds, has nothing there at all. This is your answer. She, she comes and she says, I've got nothing. How many of us have ever been in a position where we felt like when we were overwhelmed, we had nothing, no resources, no money? I don't know. I walked into my closet last night and was like, I ain't got nothing to wear, right? You ever been there? And my wife would tell you, it's, it's not true. <laughs> I've got nothing. She's got this poverty mindset, this lack mindset that says, hey, I, I don't have anything. I can't do anything. I, I've got nothing. For some of us, we get stuck there as well. We go, you know, I don't, I don't have a husband. If I just had a husband, then really I'd be fulfilled in life. A man is not going to fulfill you other than Jesus. You need Jesus. Men, you, you, I'm going to get deep for a second. Look, you feel like a wife is going to fix your pornography addiction, and it's not because you need Jesus. Nothing fixes anything. All God is really all that we need. We feel like we don't have anything. We feel like, man, you know, I don't have a, a nice enough house to host a propel group because, you know, if I'm going to host a group of people in my home, the Lord's only going to come if there's granite countertops. And I just feel like we got to, you know, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. If you and I would quit focusing on what we don't have and start focusing on what God has given us, a big shift will take place in our lives. And we'll see that in just a second. So what do you do when you don't have much? Well, here's what you do. You stop waiting for what you want and you start working with what you have. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. I feel like I just need to say it again because there's somebody who's like, oh, I don't want to hear that. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. If you and I continuously complain and grumble and moan about what we don't have, we will never be able to step into what God has for us. When we, that's what digging ditches was all about last Sunday. When we show our faith, we see his faithfulness. So we're going to pray. We're going to believe God for big things. She's asking God for a miracle. And the prophet looks at her and he says, what do you have in your house? And she says nothing. But then she comes back and she says, except a small jar of olive oil. Now, what we have to note about olive oil in this time is that olive oil was used for cooking. It was used for medicine. It was really a, a hot commodity. Uh, they didn't have Bath and Body Works where they could go get some cherry blossom moisturizer. Um, not that I know that. And so um, they, they had olive oil that was used as a moisturizer. Olive oil would also make leather pliable. It kept iron from rusting. It was used to anoint the altars where they would do offerings before God. All of this was, was so important. And she says, I've got nothing but 
but there's something I do have. There's something that I actually have. And, and, and what God will do is God will take what you have a little of and he'll multiply it. Because we have a God who lives and operates from a level of multiplication. I love this story. man. And you can look in the New Testament. You see the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. All right, so here's what happens. There was a large group of people and they were gathered. And if you get a whole bunch of people together, you got to feed them. Like, you, it's just how life works, right? You can't bring 5,000 people over to a house party and not expect to get some food out of it. So everybody's gathered and they're hungry. And the disciples come up to Jesus because they know he's all-knowing. And they go, hey, man, um, like Walmart's closed, but um, how are you going to feed all these people? And Jesus doesn't say, I want you to go. Here's a shopping list. Here's what I want you to do. If you stop by Every Walmart within a 50-mile radius will actually be able to get enough food to feed these 5,000 people. He says, well, what do we have? And there's a little kid with a lunchbox that has five loaves and two fish. And Jesus used what they had, multiplied it, and fed everyone to the point where there was so much food, people could actually take things home. You got a to-go bag from, a, from, two, from five loaves and two fish. Why? Because they stopped waiting for, what did they want? They wanted everybody to get fed, but they started working with what they had. We see this all throughout Scripture, time and time again. You see that with, with David and Goliath. I mean, David, what did he want? They, they wanted the giant to be defeated. They wanted the giant to be killed. But guess what? Nobody could take him out. And as David approaches the army and he's, he's looking at Israel and going, why, why are you standing there? Why are you so afraid? Who is this guy to stand against the armies of the living God? Everyone saw a giant that was too big to defeat. But David, man, David saw a giant that was too big to miss. And he didn't just wait for the right weapon. He used what he had. He picked up the sling and the stone and cast it and immediately took out the giant. Why? Because he didn't wait for what he wanted. He started working with what he had. He started working with what God had already provided. That's why scripture says that it's just a little faith, faith the size of a mustard seed that can move mountains. What's in your house? What are the resources that God has given you now to work with? Stop waiting for what you want. Start working with what you have. You want another example? Moses, when Moses goes to part the Red Sea, he's standing on the edge and he's looking at this sea. He's looking at this obstacle that was too big for him to overcome by himself. And he's like, God, what do you want me to do? And what does God do? God doesn't just part the water. He says, raise your staff. Use what's in your hand. Use the resources and the tools that I've given you and you'll be able to overcome anything that comes against you because he that is in you is greater than anything in this world. Amen. We have to be people who stop waiting for what you want and we start working with what we have. Can I tell you, you will never complain your way into a better job. You're never going to complain your way into a better marriage. You're not even going to gripe your way into a better marriage. You can't, you can't fix the problems you have just by talking about them. You have to do something about it. We're going to stop waiting for what we want. We're going to start working for what we have because we have a God who knows how to do a lot with just a little. God, and for some of us, here, here's what I want you to know, that God might not be giving you what you want because you're not working with what you have. Because there's, there's a biblical precedence in Scripture that says if you're faithful with little, you'll be entrusted with much. Some of you want God to bless you financially, but you won't take the steps to trust him financially. And because you're not working with what you have, you're just still waiting for what you want. But when we step out, when we step into the miracle and the story of God and we start using what he's given us, we're able to see him move in a powerful way. We're not just going to focus on what we lack. We're going to focus on what God's given us. Because some of us aren't on stage people. You have gifts, you have talents, you have abilities. For some of you, you're not an on stage person. You're not a spotlight person. You're a behind the scenes person. And here's what I want you to know, man, it's valuable. Like, like all the stuff that happens here wouldn't happen without behind the scenes people who work hard week in and week out. 
Use what God's given you. For some of you, you you don't make a six-figure income, but man, you have six nights at home a week with your kids. Stop waiting for what you want. Start working with what you have. Use the time that God's given you, that he's blessed you with, to impact your family. Because for, I'll tell you, the greatest thing you ever do might not be what you do. It might be who you raise. I'm going to say it again because that's just good preaching. (laughs) The greatest thing you will ever do is not what you do. It's who you raise. It's the next generation of people and leaders of influencers that are coming up under us. We, we don't get to just sit on the sidelines and wait for them to raise themselves. No, we're going to be people who work with what we have, who work with what God has given us. I mean, you don't have a lot of money, but here's what you can do. You can love your wife like Christ loved the church. You can take your wife out. You can treat her just as Christ would to give sacrificially. I was talking with a guy who was married the other day, and, uh, and, and we were just having a conversation, and, and he was talking about how he was miserable in his marriage. He was super frustrated. And he said, I feel like I'm putting in effort and it's not being reciprocated. I feel like I'm giving sacrificially and it's not being returned. Congratulations, you're in Scripture. <laughs> Scripture says to love your wife as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her. It wasn't reciprocal. It was sacrificial. I'm going to love you because I love you because I love you because I love you, not because I expect to get anything in return from it. We have to work with what we have. So what do we do? If you're taking notes, last thing. Offer God what you have and trust him to give you what you need. Offer God what you have and trust him to give you what you need. It says this in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. Elijah said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Now, I would be remiss if I skipped over this, but because here's what you have to understand. She, he invites her to embrace and step into a miracle, but here's how he does it. He invites her to tap into the community she's a part of to ask for help. Some of you are overwhelmed because you're fighting the battle on your own. And you got to be here next weekend because I'm going to teach all on that. And it's, it's going to be a game changer. Because here's what you need to know. Everything she needed to get the resources to do the miracle was actually in the community she was a part of. You have to be willing to embrace biblical community because you and I were created for it. Scripture says that we're a part of a body. Each part plays its unique role and function. So, so he goes on to then say, don't just ask for a few. So don't settle. Don't, don't get the bare minimum of what God has. If God has a blessing for you, if he has a miracle for you, get as much of it as you can. It says, then go outside and shut the doors behind your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each jar is filled, put it to the side. She then left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the oil jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there, are no, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. See, the oil would have continued to flow had there been an empty vessel. If you and I would stop settling for bare minimum and continue to bring God an empty vessel, he'll continue to fill it. Scripture calls you and I jars of clay. That we fill our lives with so much crud and we fill our lives with so much mess. That if we would empty ourselves of ourselves and the things that are meaningless, the things that are worthless, God would continue to fill it over and over and over again. It was as soon as the jars were gone. The oil stopped flowing. And then she went and she told the man of God. And he said, go and sell all the oil, pay your debts, and you and your son can live on what's left. When you trust God and you offer God what you have, he not only gives you what you need, but he supplies in abundance. Because he's a God who goes above and beyond. We believe culturally here at Propel that you can't outgive God. We serve a God who from his heart is generous. I mean, he, he's a giver. John 3, 16, one of the verses that, that we, we, we love so much that God so loved the world that he gave. 
like, like there's something on the heart of the Father that's generous, that's willing to give whatever. And, and you go, well, what do I have? There's a couple things you have. Time, talent, treasure. That's what Romans talks about, to give our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. We need to be empty vessels. We need to be people who give God what we have and trust him with what we need. I don't want to waste my life trying to be my own provider when I have a provider who has unlimited resources. Like you and I will work and it'll be so tiresome and so lonely and so aggravating when we're the ones trying to supply our own needs. But when we say, hey God, here's what I have. I don't have a lot, but I'm going to give you what I have. I'll trust you with what I need. I'm going to give you what I have. I'll trust you for what I need. For some of you, here's what that means. It means that you need to do just what this woman did and tap into biblical community. You haven't sank roots anywhere. You haven't been rooted. And scripture is clear. It's Sorry, that was a weird whistle. <laughs> scripture is clear. Like Psalm 93, 93, 12, those who are root, 92, 13, there we go. Those who are rooted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. You and I have to be people who get into biblical community. You're not selling your life away. You're not giving it away. Here's what you're doing. You're making the decision to say, God, I've got time on Sunday that I'm going to give to you and trust that you're going to provide what I need. For others of you, it's time to take the first step and begin to trust God financially. To stop being the one who's in control of your own money. I could share story after story with you of people who have stepped out in faith to trust God financially, and he always proves to be faithful. In fact, the only time in Scripture where God invites you and I to test him is in the area of finances, in the area of tithing. He says to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this to see that I won't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. Why? Because God knows that if you'll trust him with what you have, he'll supply everything you need. And it might not be in the way you think you need it, but here's what he does. He loves his children. If you claim the name of Jesus, you are a child of God. And you have a heavenly father who takes care of his children. He promises to never leave us nor forsake us, but life gets overwhelming at times. The only way to get through what you're going through is realize, I mean, God truly is all you need. We're going to be people who are willing to give God what we have, to trust him with what we need. Because I believe that when we do that, he supplies every time. Tenfold, fiftyfold, hundredfold. It's incredible because he's a good God. As we wrap up today's message, I I really felt like there's a, a lack that many of us feel when it comes to our relationship with God. Maybe it's inadequacy that you battle with. Maybe, I, I, I don't know what it is. When we first started the church, I gotta be honest with you, um, I, had, I had a very hard time with my inadequacies as a leader. And like, not just inadequacies as a leader, because, I mean, if you ask me, like, I think I'm a pretty good leader, but I really, I really battled with my age. I battled with my, lack of education. I graduated from Mount Pleasant High School with a 0.4 GPA. Not, not like a, a 4.0, right? Don't, don't flip those numbers. 0.4, okay? Terrible. Highly uneducated. And here's what God continuously reminded me. If you'll give me what you have, I'll supply everything you need. And so we took steps over and over. God, this is all I got. I ain't got much, but here you go. And I trust you. And every time I felt weak, he showed me that he was strong. And every time I felt like I was in darkness, he showed me that he truly is 
light. Every time I felt hungry, he showed me that he is the bread of life. Every time I felt lost, he showed me the way. Every time I felt thirsty, he gave me water to drink. Every time I felt unstable, he showed me that he is my rock and my foundation. And that's my prayer for you. That no matter what your need is today, no matter how you came in, if you feel overwhelmed, that you would understand that God is all you need. Let's pray. God, we come to you today and we thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you that you have showed us through your word that you are looking for empty vessels and through empty vessels we can experience life and life abundantly. Lord, I thank you that everything that's empty in our lives can be filled through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray today that we'd realize that you are all we need. God, that people would stop waiting for what we want. We'd start working with what we have. If you're in here today and you'd say, hey, I feel overwhelmed and I need to give that over to God today, would you just lift your hand all around the room? All around the room. Here's what I want you to know. Because of your willingness to say, God, I've got some issues. Because of your willingness to cry out for help, God will fill those empty spaces in your life. So Lord, right now I pray that every person in this room who's feeling overwhelmed, who's feeling burdened, that they'd feel the presence of your Holy Spirit rest on them. That God, every empty place, every empty area would be filled through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And I believe that there are some of you in here today as well that need to make the decision to surrender control of your life over to God. See, this woman had a debt on her life that she couldn't pay for herself. She needed God to intervene. That's what Scripture says about you and I, that because of sin, the payment or the penalty of sin is death. We deserve death. We deserve to pay for our own sins. But God in His love and His grace and mercy would make a way where there was no way. He looked down at humanity and he desired to be connected in relationship with you and I. So he sends Jesus to die on our behalf. And here's what he does. He doesn't ask you to fix yourself. He doesn't ask you to become perfect. He doesn't ask for you to bring a special offering. He sends the offering. Scripture says that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. While you still had faults, and and we all still do, while you still had failures, you still had mess ups. God didn't look at you and say, fix those. And then we'll talk about it. He said, I love you enough that I'll die for it. And Jesus came and he paid the price of death so that through him, you and I could experience life. And the reason why many of us are so overwhelmed is not just because we have a lot going on. It's because we're still the ones in control of our own life. And I'll be honest, if you're anything like me, you realize that I do a great job of messing up my life when I'm the one in control of it. But when I surrender my life to God, when I give him what I have, he supplies what I need. So if you're here with every head bowed, every eye closed today, and you'd say, I realize that I need to surrender control of my life. You know, there's a bumper sticker that says, um, Jesus is my co-pilot. Stupid bumper sticker. Because <laughs> if Jesus is your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. <laughs> if you're the one still driving, if you're the one still in control, and today you need to surrender your life to Jesus, would you just lift your hand? See those. Here's what I want to do, church. I want to invite all of us to pray together. Nobody prays alone. Will you say this with me? Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying in my place. Today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you, knowing that you can save me. Thank you for giving me new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, let's celebrate with those who just made decisions for Jesus this morning. Amen. Hey, you can stand to your feet for a second. We're going to continue in worship for just a moment. We're going to sing a song called Do It Again. And here's what what it talks about, is that we've seen God move in the past. 
and he can do it again. I don't know what you're facing, but here's what I know. We serve a God who didn't decide today to quit on you. We serve a God who is faithful and is able to do anything. Let's worship.